Victorious Failure by Bryce Walton Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, April 1947 Narrated by Tom Trisser With good reason, Professor H. Clawson hesitated. His wife's arms were holding him with a strangely insistent urgency and fear. He tried to disengage himself, but not with much enthusiasm. Although he had not admitted it to anyone but the Presidium psychomedic staff, he was afraid, too. Desperately and helplessly afraid. Howard, please! Her pale blue eyes were wide, staring into his with that intimacy only someone loved completely and without compromise ever sees. Don't go back to the laboratories, Howard. Don't ever go back again. He smiled, unsuccessfully. He had never been able to hide anything from Lynn. But, dear, this is ridiculous. We're scientists. We're not frightened by vague, intangible fears. Her hands tightened on his shoulders. We're scientists, so let us admit the obvious. Something doesn't want you to ever complete your research, Howard. We've worked together for ten years, and now you're right on the verge of discovering the secret of life itself. And it means more to humanity than anything else in the history of mankind. But I'm afraid, Howard, and so are you. Whatever is against us stopped you before. Your mind almost broke. It will try again, and this time your mind may not recover. He managed to push her from him, and immediately he felt lonelier, isolated. His faint laugh sounded foolishly insincere. Lynn, for the love of science, you sound like a mystic. Any mind is liable to become unintegrated. You talk about invisible, intangible forces. These things can only be in men's minds, dear. No mentality is immune to disorientation. She sobbed. Her head swung back and forth hopelessly. A cloud of lovely hair glinted liquidly in the shifting light from the harmonics glowing from the transparent walls of their apartment. He couldn't leave her in this state. Lynn, darling! Listen to me. I can't abandon my life's work, particularly something so profoundly important to humanity. One more projection, and my closed system principle will be concluded. After that, think of it, Lynn, this is really the one thing mankind has been seeking. All his other activities are only bypaths. With eternal life possible, Mankind will have a real reason for struggling onward, Lynn. No, Howard, she was saying brokenly, there isn't an argument. To me, your mind is more important. Why did your mind black out just before you could finish your last experiment? Why, the whole magnificent psychomedical staff at the Presidium couldn't find a reason. All the charts show you to be amazingly normal. There is something bigger than our science, Howard. It doesn't intend for you to ever finish your research. A woman's intuition, he said sardonically. Not a woman's, she corrected. Ours, because you feel it the same as I do. A sick, vague fear came over him as he stood there nervously, remembering the gleaming, arched height of the biochemistry wards at the World Science Presidium. That singularly awful instant just before he could finish his last experiment, when all his mental faculties had crumbled. The microfilm projector had just commenced whirring, then that final spiralling downward into the desperate grey fear and unconsciousness. There had to be a logical explanation, so that whatever blockage stood between him and the conclusion of his research could be torn down. The secret of the single cell had long been his. Whatever that three-dim microphoto film revealed, 
He and only he could turn the key to open the ultimate secret door into victorious eternity for all mankind. Now he blinked burning eyes. Lin was, of course, right. He felt it, too. A hidden, omnipresent kind of force that would prevent him from completing his research. But such a thought was adult infantilism at best. A hidden force. In his world there had to be logical sequence of cause and effect, but even the psychomedic staff hadn't been able to find one. Howard, she was saying, lips quivering, remember our moon house? Clawson bristled, froze. I remember. The world gave us a magnificent marble house on the moon overlooking Schroeter's Canyon, a return favour for my many gifts to mankind. What a juvenile farce! Imagine me sitting up there on the moon, with you, two futile little escapists, haunted by our own uselessness and our fears. No, Lynn, I've my particular destiny to fulfil. It isn't hiding away on the moon. I'll never accept retirement on the moon, or any place else either now or after my research on the life force. I'd rather die than stop working in science. He started for the exit panel. Her voice cut deeply, slowed him, turned him. You're going to the laboratories again, then? she asked faintly, in spite of what happened before. He nodded, but when he tried to say yes, his throat was dry and sticky. "'Good-bye, Howard,' she said. She was crying when he left. It made him feel terribly lost and guilty to leave her crying. But he had to. What made it so bad was that Lynn had never cried before. She was so strong emotionally. Without any real cause, this made him more nervous and irritable. But he was one of the world's greatest scientists— Everything must have a cause, somewhere, some time. His gyrocar dropped down on the spacious roof landing of the biochemistry building at the World Science Presidium. It was beginning to rain, solid, heavy, sharp driving drops that spattered on the dull plastic mesh as he walked hurriedly across it to the ingress. Hello, Professor Clawson. This is a surprise. I didn't know you would be coming back so soon. Clawson started violently, clutched at his heart. A sudden shooting pain was there. Yet the staff had found nothing wrong with his mental or physical integration. They had checked and rechecked. Oh, it's you, Larry, he paused, relieved. You, you startled me, Larry. I didn't see anyone on the landing. I just came over to do a little work on my own, Larry explained. He was a young, enthusiastic, highly capable student biochemist with a shock of unruly black hair. He had graduated from World Tech seven years ago and had been Clausen's assistant for five, working with him faithfully, sometimes during those gruelling sixty-four hour stretches. He had been the only one with Clausen when he had lost consciousness. Didn't expect you back so soon, Professor, said Larry talking casually as the elevator dropped them down below the sub-floor level into the spacious, almost vaulted silence of Clausel's private laboratories. "'Say, Professor, you intend to try to finish up again tonight?' Clausen stiffened. He was here. He felt capable enough. It was only a matter of a few hours. Why not? Even as a therapeutic measure. "'I believe I will, Larry.' I wasn't intending to, but now that you're here too, I might as well. Larry said nothing. He stood in the soft yet full brilliance of the invisible fluoresce, his black, almost blue hair hanging over his eyes. He smiled. Clausen started. He had never quite responded this way to Larry's expression before. It seemed peculiar, rather strange. He discarded that chain of thought, and looked about his laboratory. Nothing had changed. 
Not that Clausen had expected things to be different. The microphoto film cabinets stood tier upon tier, a long stretch of recorded effort, a complete step-by-step -step intricate process of creating life from that awesome moment when he had known the successful preparation of the first simple colloid and had started on his first organic synthesis. Through the actual combination of the first molecules and the organic colloid, and then the first tiny speck of synthesized protoplasm, the frenzied day and night battle against time. Time, that was the predominant factor in nature that did the trick. But he had compressed millions of years into twenty-five. From simple organic compound, through the simple colloid, the protein, the primitive protoplasm, the simplest unicellular organism, the flagellate, and then the great jump into the structure of the gene, the ferreting out of that intricate, vital combination that gave man life and maintained it. He had conquered, almost. The high arched ceiling in the lab with its glowing columns and its streamlined equipment had been provided him by the entire earth, provided him by man's cooperative faith in himself, men who would find so much greater an impetus to fight ahead if they only knew that whatever other success they might have, their ultimate end was inevitably life, instead of death. But he would affirm a greater investment of their faith than their wildest dream had ever granted him. No other man or combination of men in the world could synthesize all the knowledge in those cabinets and emerge with the final answer that he alone could evolve. No one but himself. Larry Verrill might possibly develop some capacity to work on the chain, but unlikely. High specialization had made it Clausen's responsibility alone. Enthusiasm, eagerness was returning, the fear was gone. It's so simple, really, now that it's practically over, he said as he unzipped his aerogel cloak and stepped toward the microphoto film projector. He was talking mostly to himself, a habit of his, only partly to Verrill. Yes, said Larry softly, I suppose you might call it simple. Carell saw to it that cells with which he experimented had a chance to achieve immortality. Under controlled conditions, the growth proceeds forever, logically. The body, a collection of cells, is a closed system. Like a gyrocar, that's what we called it, didn't we, Larry? No closed system can endure unless it can inspect itself, oil itself, and keep itself in repair. A gyrocar can't do that, but the body can and does, though imperfectly. Clausen warmed to his subject, and his voice assumed a fresh vigour. We've conquered that imperfection. Yet I can hardly believe it myself. People can go on living without that final terrible unconscious fear of death that must defeat them. One more projection, Larry. One remaining link for correlation. The answer is right here on this projector, an actual three-dimensional record of the very first spark in the heart of the cell itself, the primary bursting of a carbon atom co-mingling with a shingle cell, creating life. It's the first and the final record, Larry. Larry nodded, but his lips were twisted in a rather sad, cynical smile, it seemed to Clausen. So simple, isn't it, Professor? Yes, it really is, asserted Clausen, his enthusiasm blinding him to the peculiar reaction of Larry Verrill. Whatever is revealed in this three-dim projector will contain the final step for the infinite prolongation of human life. When I synthesize it with Compton's H9 film, we'll have it. Incredible, isn't it? You may not realize just how incredible. How could you? said Verrill. Nor I either, for that matter. Clausen hesitated, his hand frozen above the button that would throw the projector into life. Then, shrugging, his hand started to move down. But it didn't. For then, unbelievably, terrifyingly, it happened a second time. Professor H. Clausen 
felt a blackness encompassing the mighty vaulted laboratory. It closed in tightly, smothering, icy. It wrapped his entire swirling mind in darkness. A little round man smiled broadly at him from a stool close to his bed in the psycho ward. "'Remember me, Professor?' His face beamed with self-possession. "'You're the clinic psychologist who handled the other electroencephal checkup,' said Clawson quickly. "'Or are you?' "'Good recall,' commented the psychologist. "'Name's Dunnell. I've rechecked your whole file since your uh, second disorientation. Weak alphas, of course, but that's necessary in your type. No dysrhythmia. Tempo's exceptionally well balanced.' Look, Professor Clausen, there is still no logical reason for your being here. But meanwhile, these charts don't fib. But I'm not so smug as to think we know so much about the old cortex. Still, logically, we can't find a reason. But there must be a— Oh, we'll find out, Professor. How do you feel now? The harmonics working all right. Not quite, Dunnell. Both time I have been— well, terribly afraid, before the attacks. Some kind of intuition. My wife noticed it, too. You're beginning to build delusions and rationalizations. We must guard against that. You're bound to put undue emphasis on it, make it far more complex and important than it really is, because it happened at such critical moments. You deal in absolutes, Professor. Cause must equal effect." "'But it wasn't coincidence either time,' insisted Clausen. "'Not logically. Coincidence is too simple to handy a gadget, Dunnell, isn't it?' "'Maybe,' said Dunnell, lighting a cigarette. "'Anyway, I won't burden you with a lot of hasty probing around. "'The staff says you're OK to leave the clinic today. "'Come to my office tomorrow afternoon if you feel like it. "'If you don't, call me up and tell me why. "'See you tomorrow.' A little later, after the staff had given him another thorough going-over which revealed nothing amiss, he met his wife, who was waiting for him with a gyrocar on the roof landing. Only a third of Clausen's normal life was gone, yet he looked twice his age, except for rare moments like this. He kissed Lynn almost boyishly as they stood together looking over the gleaming plastic structures piercing a clear blue sky. A soft, warm summer wind blew disarmingly over Washington. Finally, Clausen said abruptly, "'I'm sorry, Lynn. You were right. I'll admit the obvious. Something beyond the scope of our science is blocking my progress. But what is it?' She shook her head, her eyes brooding with concern for him, deep, dark. "'I've talked with the Science Council,' she finally said in a whisper. She turned with resolution to face him. Howard, they have agreed with me. You need a very long vacation. Our moon house is gathering lunar dust, if there is any. I have the council's support now. We are going to the moon, and we are not going to think about anything that even suggests biochemistry. There isn't any such a thing, not on this world, said Clausen. Howard, we're going to raise extraterrestrial flowers. Clausen stared, and was suddenly and violently angry. Flowers? You're mad. But the council's on my side, Howard. They're going to— She paused, lips trembling. Going to accept your resignation from the Presidium. A sick hate flooded his stomach, burst in his brain. He was stunned, impotent. He quivered silently. It was their own staff that had said there was nothing wrong with him. Yet they were demanding that he resign. Rest on that, escrapist's bromide lunar. Retreat from reality, rot in meaningless isolation. I'll not do it, Lynn, he announced harshly. I refuse to drop a conclusion that might mean the final step in human evolution. He was dazed, ill, as she led him silently into the gyrocar and piloted it to their apartment. No use arguing with Lynn about it. She had that ageless woman's selfish love to protect her own kind. She and the council had combined to work against him instead of helping him solve the cursed enigma. 
As soon as they reached home, Clausen contacted the council president, Gaudet, on the teleaudio. He argued the case, objected fiercely, begged. Gaudet was kind, logical. "'We're all so sorry, Clausen,' his huge head said, "'but it is quite obvious that you absolutely need a lengthy period of relaxation. Although our own staff can find no logical basis for this decision, we undoubtedly shall, and soon. You worked almost steadily for ten years. It is very possible that some highly specialised cellular blockage has developed that even our probers have failed to detect. A few years raising flowers, as Mrs. Clausen has suggested, something completely dissociated from your present work, is probably the answer. Then you can return to your laboratories. Meanwhile, your assistant, Larry Verrill, can continue with your research, perhaps. Verrill is an excellent assistant, Clausen said, controlling himself with difficulty. But he can never finish my work. I operate many times empirically. You know that. My brain alone holds the key to correlate most of the basic links of the chain. But no amount of discussion could persuade Godet. It had all been definitely decided by the council in Lynn. He would retire to the moon house by Schroeder's Canyon and raise fantastic flowers in the moon's unique environmental conditions. He would vegetate and rot with the flowers. Raising flowers, Clausen sagged, groaned helplessly, desperately. The next afternoon in Dunnell's office, with its psycho-harmonies shifting benevolently from the opaque walls, Dunnell was saying, Fear of failure, that's one possibility. Unlikely, though. Doesn't check with your psycho-charts. There's no doubt, Clausen said. I'm just as certain about this conclusive step as I've been about every one I've taken since I began. But you don't know, Dunnell pointed out, until you've concluded, and some elusive sensor prevents that. Wait, here's another possibility. Maybe you're afraid of the consequences of giving humanity the ability to live forever. Think of what it would mean. Think of it consciously. I can't. It's too big. Every basic pattern completely altered. Psychology and the social sciences, particularly, would no longer apply. Humanity would become something unhuman by all present standards of evaluation. It's really an alien concept, Professor. Subconsciously, you're afraid of what it would mean. I see your reasoning there, Donnell. Frankly, I've never considered that at all. I've been so wrapped up in the thing itself. But let's assume that your subconscious has been working on it, insisted Donnell. I tell you, Professor... You go back to that laboratory of yours right now. Get in there with all the fatal paraphernalia and just introspect for a while. Think of the whole, and go beyond the limits of your specialised course. There are so many possible consequences to a sudden transition from mortality to immortality. Think about the things that can and will happen. Seems to me that might well be the motivation for the fear— and, Professor, come back and see me tomorrow. Clausen was like the pilots who get rocket psychosis on their first lunar run, and who must immediately make another flight, or lose their resistance to space fear forever. He must go back to the laboratory, try again. And Donald's diagnosis about Clausen's possible fear of the consequences of giving humanity sudden immortality he definitely had something there. Clausen wondered why he had never thought of it before. Like Dunnell had said, it would change every present standard of humanity. The enormity of the possible repercussion. Clausen trembled a little with triumph. Yes, that could be the basis for the fear. A scientist must weigh the consequences of his discoveries. Would the secret of eternal life be a boon, or a catastrophe for man? Clausen entered a public telaudio booth, and got Verrill's apartment in East Washington. Verrill's eyes seemed to have changed. They looked like those of someone else. Ridiculous. 
Yes, he did need a rest. Verrill, he said tightly, I'm going back to the laboratory again, right now. I want you there, too. Verrill's eyes widened, then narrowed. His mouth slipped into that sad, cynical grin. If you insist, Professor, and you always would, of course. Why, er, uh, naturally I will, said Clawson. Meet me then, fifteen minutes. The teleaudio faded, but Clawson sat there a moment. He brushed at his face wearily. So strange, the way Verrill had talked, like a stranger almost. But fifteen minutes later, the vaulted height of the gleaming laboratory was very silent, and seemed somehow cold as Clausen saw Verrill walking toward him. Verrill seemed to blot out the laboratory, loom extraordinarily large before him. Clausen had unconsciously been backing away. He felt the hard, cold light of the supporting column against the small of his back. He was looking fearfully into Larry Verrill's eyes. Into his eyes! Into incredible, swirling blackness! Into space and time and eternity! And Professor H. Clausen knew. Varro, said the thin, wavering body, it is time for your little transmigration. The switcher is ready. Don't think too much about what you must do. We are four-dimensional, but we are still not very well adapted to the complications of the coordinate stream. Clausen knew, yet it was far beyond his capacity to understand. He was seeing something that had happened, yet was still to happen. Fourth dimensionally, time, as he knew it, was meaningless. The man who had spoken in this strange world revealed by Verrill's alien brain was named Grosko. The other figure, Varro, was also Verrill. Clausen knew that, but he understood very little. Grosko's boneless fingers were manipulating the Matrix coordinate console. "'I've never been convinced,' muttered Varro. "'It is an incomprehensible cycle, even to our fourth-dimensional minds. Where can there ever be an illogical end?' "'We have already taken on some of your three-dimensional characteristics, those of Verrill, whose body you will assume control of, and merge your mentality with. Already you are beginning to think in terms of absolutes, in terms of three-dimensional logic. Forget a hypothetical end, which our fourth-dimensional consciousness knows cannot exist. You will encounter no difficulties.' You will gradually adjust yourself to their concepts of the Absolute, but still you will retain enough of your Varro mentality to carry out your assignment. But it seems so unprogressive in the universal sense, persisted Varro. Everything seems only a big, futile circle. But not for us. That is your three-dimensional absolutism creeping in already, though you have not even begun merging with Verrill yet. You are beginning to make premature psychological adjustments. There are countless tangents of probability, and in the particular one that has evolved us, Professor Clausen must be prevented from completing his research. If he does, we will not evolve. But of course we have evolved, so it is inevitable that you will carry out your assignment successfully. Inevitable. No free agency! Even in the eternal sense, mused Varro, everything in all dimensions of space-time is interdependent. We are aware of it, because of our fourth-dimensional minds, but those of Clausen's stage of development are not. That is correct, said Grosko. They realize that everything that has happened is determined by a complex array of circumstantial causes, but they see this only in immediate comprehensible perspective. The same is true in the universal also, and in the time and limb, which their three-dimensional consciousness cannot comprehend. Cause and effect, fourth-dimensionally, works also in what they would consider reversal. What they see as an effect is also cause. They tie in past, future, present, with cause and effect. 
Really, there is no association. An effect can be in what they consider their past, and a cause can exist in their future. But you will understand after you assume possession of Verrill's consciousness. I hope so. It certainly seems terribly involved to me right now. That is a natural reaction of Verrill's mind, which you are already beginning to associate yourself with. Well, Varro, you are ready for the complete alteration? Naturally, said Varro. It is on the chronoscopic charts, isn't it? Goodbye, then, said Grosko. Don't use the power unless you find it absolutely necessary, then only mildly, of course. Varro was enveloped in the radiations of the Matrix. His consciousness molecules leaked slowly into the unsuspecting and narrow confines of Larry Verrill's three-dimensional consciousness as he graduated from World Tech in 2081, two years before he was to become the laboratory assistant of Professor H. Clausen. You, your Varro? Clausen managed in a hoarse whisper. Larry Verrill nodded. A curtain had dropped over Verrill's eyes, behind which those incredible, incomprehensible vistas had opened for a brief interim. Clausen staggered. There was no basic comprehension. No two-dimensional being could imagine such a thing as up. What he termed past, present, future, to a fourth-dimensional concept, would be regarded in the same way as if he, Clausen, were floating a mile in the air regarding the activities of a two-dimensional plane man. Their only temporal sense would involve simply horizontal movement. And his three-dimensional concepts wouldn't even conceive of those of Varro's. For Varro there was no past, present, future, as Clausen saw them. Varro and Grosko and their world was really a future stage of man to Clausen. But Clausen and his world of 2089 was not really the past to Varro. It was only a part of the time and limb, a term which was meaningless to Clausen. It referred to the oneness of space-time, which was clearly envisioned in the fourth-dimensional minds. You're not human, Clausen finally managed to say. It sounded strange, and somewhat absurd to him after he said it. No, agreed Verrill, or Varro, and I might say to you, you're not an ape. You think of past and future as somehow separate. I can only tell you that it is all a kind of oneness which we call the time and limb. You realise now that my being here is inevitable. It isn't a matter of probability. It was never intended that you should finish this experiment, so that the present stage of humanity might live forever, forever itself as a word, being meaningless abstraction. But how can someone from the future come back through time to influence the present so that they will— Verrill interrupted impatiently. That has already been partially explained. Your three-dimensional brain can never understand it fully. Sufficient to say, Professor Clausen, that immortality— by its very nature, is impossible. Clausen sagged despondently, futilely. He was sitting on a stool, looking up. There was no impulse to escape, or to attempt to avoid what was too obviously his end. Why? he asked listlessly. Why is immortality impossible? Put it this way, Professor, Clausen winced. The voice sounded so like the harmless, youthful, and rather naive Larry Verrill. Immortality means the cessation of man's association with the process of entropy. Your developing makes another integral part of the entropic process possible. You call it evolution. He paused, then continued. You regard us as human. You have other labels, mutants, homo superiors, or even supermen. But we only develop in this process called by you evolution. Can't you see the paradox of immortality? It would be feasible if immortality was some part of the evolving process, but it isn't. It might be in some other line of probability, but not this particular one. Look into what you call the past, Professor. 
Verrill's eyes were narrow, inscrutable. If the ape had suddenly developed immortality, you wouldn't have evolved. Thinking man could never have evolved from an immortal and therefore stagnant race of apes. Just as mortal man came from apes, so Homo superior evolves from mortal man. Paradoxically, there can be no immortality, if the true racial chain is to survive. Clawson sat stiffly. Well, Dunnell had gotten close to the correct solution, though he could never dream of the truth. There had been a deeply buried subconscious fear of the results of immortality. It would have destroyed the, well, what he called, man's future. There was one thing that might be explained. Why have you allowed me to advance as far as I have in my research? Verrill smiled sadly. Your whole concept is based on false logic, he said, but I can't explain. There isn't a question of allowing you. You see, you had to develop this far with your experimentation. Your work involving cosmic ray treatment of genes resulted in certain germplasm alteration in certain individuals. This will bring about our fourth dimensional emergence in what you call later as mutants. Then, said Clausen faintly, I am also responsible for you. The young man nodded. You could term it that, but it's all an integral whole. You deal in cause and effect, but the closest you can get to our logic is to hyphenate it endlessly. Cause effect, cause effect, cause effect, cause effect, cause effect, cause effect, without end. There was a heavy silence. Then Verrill said, not unkindly, I had better take care of you now, Professor. Your mind will have to bear far too much strain. Your reasoning processes will demand an explanation which, for your three dim consciousness, is impossible. You will develop a psychosis unless I alter your mind sufficiently. What are you going to do? whispered Clawson, his mouth dry. By suggestion, I'll alter your basic behaviour and motivation patterns. You will retain most of your present mental characteristics. Amnesia followed by new and fundamentally different lines of activity. Clausen started to run away, but he found himself sucked into a whirling maelstrom of senseless, unrelated chaos. He reeled dizzily. He felt himself falling. He saw his laboratory assistant, Larry Verrill, standing above him, saying with nervous concern, Professor, you fainted again. You all right now? Clausen felt a queer, shocking sensation, an intangible impulse, rather painful. No, Larry, he replied. It's over with me now. I really don't think I could have succeeded in achieving immortality for mankind anyway. There's a flaw in the chain of development somewhere, and the whole procedure is so complex we could never go over it and find the error. Good night, Larry. I'm going home. He didn't wait for his gyro car to reach his apartment to tell Lynn the startling developments. He contacted her by teleaudio. I've changed my mind, Lynn, dear. I've decided to accept your and the Council's advice. Get together everything we'll want to take to Moon House with us. And, by the way, get all the microfilm you can find on botany and extraterrestrial horticulture. I wonder what has been the matter with me all my life. Her face shone with a lovely pink flush of happiness as it faded from the small screen. Clausen relaxed as the gyrocar sped toward his apartment. His eyes closed. His daydream was one of glorious technicolour, overflowing with mental reproductions of the magnificent flowers he and Lynn would grow in the quiet comfort of the Lunarian Valleys. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. It's just one small click for man. One giant something. <laughs>